obviously I'm here to talk about sort of data center cloud migration, um, but I want to make it clear, first of all, that we're not just talking about migrating whole data centers. That's, that's a huge undertaking. Um, very, very rarely does somebody take an entire data center and move it to the cloud. It does happen. More often what happens is people put a toe in the water and they start with, you know, a, a small set of servers or a discrete set of services, et cetera, and they move those. The common drivers that you can see on the screen there for data center or stroke server migration, the main ones actually increase business agility. So I don't know how many people have worked in banks and financial institutions, but certainly my experience has been that if you ask for a server for a new project, for example, your project had better be longer than three months because that's how long it's going to take them to give you a new server. Um, the agility that you get with clouds, the flexibility to stand up infrastructure, to try something out, to pull the infrastructure down again, et cetera, is unparalleled. You, you just can't achieve that in any other type of scenario. So business agility tends to be a really big driver. Supply chain issues, um, again, I'm, I'm hearing noises from from the market people that are placing multi-million euro multi-billion pound orders with some of the big suppliers of particularly networking equipment for example are finding the orders are being accepted and then they're being told that there's a delay of one to two and a half years to actually fulfill that that order so supply chain issues are uh, a big big issue arising and a big drag on your ability to stand up new infrastructure or indeed refresh or replace your existing. Um, the data center providers, the likes of Microsoft, et cetera, have such buying power and such large existing implement implementations that they don't really suffer that issue. Cost and capacity optimization, we're all familiar with this. It's the you know scale up when needed, scale down when not needed type of approach to, uh, to cloud. But if you buy in a fixed infrastructure and you place it in your basement or in your data center, that is your capacity. <clears throat> you're not going to scale it up. You're not going to scale it down. You have bought your capacity and therefore you have to buy for what you need as the highest scale you're going to achieve. And the rest of the time, the infrastructure is running at, at less than optimal performance. So that is that is another big driver is the ability to match the consumption, the power that you're using, whether that's computer storage to your actual need as opposed to buy for max capacity. And then, of course, the costs of that infrastructure track in the cloud with your usage are not static based upon what you need as the peak performance. Access to advanced cloud services. Well, there are many services in the cloud that we, we help our customers to use from AI to advanced security services, et cetera, which don't really have their equivalent available on premise. You can connect them to on premise, but it's significantly easier to consume them if your services are running in the cloud where they reside in the first place. And then very, very pertinent coming up this winter, Ask yourself the question for your organization, what are you going to do if and when the lights go out during the winter? We're being warmed up, I suppose, by the government and by notifications coming out that there could be issues with supply due to supply of gas issues. And I think something like 40 percent of Ireland's electricity consumption is driven by gas generated electricity. So the natural assumption is there's going to be some outages. Well, if there's outages, will your services remain online? Will your online services still continue to deal with your customers? Because not the whole country will be out. Some of your customers will still be able to access them, uh, but not if they're on premise, right? And not unless you've got significant power back up. All the Azure data centers have the usual UPS, massive battery arrays and generators plus contracted diesel supply. I can run almost indefinitely without a main power supply and still service your customers that have power. Then, of course, the topic of today is sustainability. Um, there is significant opportunity to reduce your carbon footprint by moving to uh, the Azure data center, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the main. So if you look at the journey to cloud maturity, I mean, every every organization has a different journey that they undertake, right? But typically what we've seen in the past has been People moving workloads such as backup, file backup, storage uh, type capabilities tends to be a starting point. It's a really easy thing to do. You, you do your backup um, and you designate a cloud storage provider. You might not think of it as adopting the cloud, but you've just adopted the cloud by doing that. Then what we tend to see is people moving into the Office 365 domain. So they may have the on-premise exchange servers, that type of thing for email. They move those to the cloud um, and make use of that infrastructure and, and remove some of the infrastructure they have in-house. Now, the ordering can vary, of course, but once you've put your toe into Office 365, you'll find that there are online versions of services that you may very well have on-premise, 
And the likes of SharePoint can be, in big installations, quite a complex infrastructure to maintain yourselves with SQL servers and web servers and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so moving that to SharePoint Online then gives you the benefit that it's a managed service and you no longer have to worry about the infrastructure patching, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a logical step for many organizations. And then we see sort of non Office 365 type workloads getting virtualized and moved to the cloud. So you may have a bespoke solution uh, running on a Windows server or Linux, indeed, they're, they're equally virtualizable. Uh, and that moves into the cloud and you start to have a hybrid implementation where some of your services are in, in your on premise infrastructure, some of it in the cloud infrastructure. On that little box there, if anybody recognizes it, then you're as old as me. There's a PDP-9. Um, you would have found those hanging around in very limited quantities in early 1980s. It's actually the first box I ever saw or worked with that was a multi-user uh, server. And an you know, incredible level of disappointment that it had naturally no flashing lights on it. I, I believe this, the, the whole Star Trek story as I was growing up, that all computers had big arrays of flashing lights above them. And this real computer? Not one, really disappointing. But but taking actual legacy hardware, uh, taking legacy applications and re-architecting them for the cloud uh, is something we find we get engaged in an awful lot. Uh, re-architecting them, wrapping them in services, making them accessible, giving them APIs, et cetera, so you can call them from other places, uh, but basically removing them from your on-premise and making use of the cloud services. And then at some point on that journey, most organizations find the advanced services like that's the Azure Sentinel, for example, there um, and the uh, um, AI services and so on and so forth on the cloud come into play. They find they find great utility at some point in that journey uh, and where it is varies from from organization to organization. So. Let's have a look uh, because you need a defined methodology. You can't just sort of dive into this at, at random. So Microsoft define and we use the, the cloud adoption framework as our approach. And that involves defining a strategy. So what are your what are your motivations? What are the business outcomes you want to achieve? Um, obviously, creating a plan. Failure to plan is plan for failure and then getting ready to do it. So prepping, looking at the what the first what they call a landing zone, which is your first piece of architecture or infrastructure you're going to move, what it looks like in the cloud, looking at capacity. So measuring the services you're currently running uh, and what kind of compute and storage and bandwidth and so on that they are using. So you can create an appropriate environment for them to arrive into the cloud on all prepared and all scaled and all ready to go. And then the uh, adoption phase of actually migrating some of the workflows and innovating, so maybe making use of cloud services that you don't have available on premise. Inevitably, then there's a management and a governance that requires to wrap around this, but the whole thing is iterative. So the point is it isn't a big bang, it comes in waves and you define a wave of migration will bring these services, this infrastructure into the cloud, will decommission these other things as a result. Then we'll look at it, we'll reassess what's the next wave, the next wave, the next wave eventually. And each wave has a business case associated with it that shows why you should be doing it. Now, some of the specific savings. So Forrester Research did a assessment um, to look at energy and carbon consumption across the board in migrations into Azure. If you look at storage, just storage alone, just moving storage, 71 to 79 percent more energy efficient in the Azure cloud. The difference in range varies from the type of storage you have. Um, but where it gets really interesting is if you look at the energy taken into account, the energy consumed converts into emissions, the carbon emissions reductions on storage migration to the cloud, 79 to 83 percent lower than traditional enterprise data center. It does vary. There is a range. It varies depending upon the type of storage you're moving and the type of you know, storage density and type of systems you had, whether they're direct attached storage, uh, which has the highest carbon footprint on premise, or whether they're large, you know, high density NAS arrays, for example, which has the lowest. But the lowest that they're forecasting is a 79% reduction in the emissions. Now that's that can't be ignored, right? If we look at exchange online then we're about 77 to 85% of the energy and 97 to 98% lower emissions for exchange online versus exchange on premise, largely due to the uh, utilization and the density with which 
that Microsoft within the Azure data centers can pack in the compute, the storage, the bandwidth and so on and so forth. Um, and the efficiency they can get out of those machines that are running in the cloud versus the kind of density that you'd have on premise. But 97 to 98% lower. I mean, if you say that to your sustainability director, they're going to bite your hand off. SharePoint online savings, 29 to 93 and 72 to 97%. Again, depends upon the size of your farm. Don't worry, I'm going a bit quick. I know you will be able to read the graphs and get everything out of it, but we will circulate the slides afterwards. Um, and I have a bit of a summary table too. But the point is with SharePoint Online, because of the complexity of SharePoint, the number of moving parts, the number of services that are acquired within it, again, Microsoft can highly optimize using the Azure fabric, the, the management layers within Azure, the usage of the infrastructure within Azure. And also, it's very important to point out in these graphs at the bottom, you'll see the little uh, or the higher green bar on the bottom right hand side is Microsoft using uh, grid power, so normal electrical power. But a lot of Microsoft data centers are actually powered by renewable energy, uh, or at least a very high mix of renewable energy. And that renewable energy is considered to generate zero carbon footprint because it's entirely driven from wind or sun or whatever. And therefore, you're not generating any carbon emissions by consuming it. And that gives you the 72 to 97. So then the 72, depending on workload, 97 if you've got the most amenable workload and are using the renewable energy. Finally, compute savings. So compute savings, 52 to 79% um, in energy. And again, 92 to 98% efficient um, in terms of the, uh, the usage. Now, my timer running on my screen tells me I'm done for time, but I've got a couple of slides left, so you bear with me. Summary slide. Um, again, the type of efficiencies that you will get varies from the how you've implemented that workload on premise stroke in your data center using very high end infrastructure, very high densities of CPUs, storage, etc. Then you will get a lower saving, but even the lowest saving on that grid is 79%, right? That is absolutely unignorable. <laughs> and you know, when I ask yourself your question and ask your colleagues the question, what other initiatives can deliver this impact as quickly with all the associated advantages of cloud migration, because as I called out the head of this, savings in CO2 equivalent carbon emissions is only one of many, many advantages of moving and migrating to the cloud. To support that journey, there are a lots of tooling that we can use provided by Microsoft for measuring your current performance on the cloud, uh, sorry, on, on premise and sizing your necessary infrastructure and deploying automated uh, landing zone deployments, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it a much smoother journey. Um, but there's also tools for after you've delivered. So we run, for example, within technology, within TechEnable, we have two of these tools running. So we measure our Office 365 Azure consumption. There's a Power BI tool that anybody can go out and deploy. Um, you just Google for it, you'll find it. Uh, that will actually give you insight into your emissions generated out of Office 365. Similarly, down the bottom right hand side, there's an equivalent tool for Azure as well, which will tell you not only the emissions that you're generating from your Azure footprint as it currently stands, but also give a comparison with what it would have been with an on-premise workload. OK, so you can start to get an assessment of where you stand in terms of your cloud utilization. And then finally, a little bit later in this presentation, uh, Ritika is going to be talking about Microsoft Sustainability Manager, which is a tool uh, that I'll let her describe, but it gives a much broader context in terms of describing your, your sustainability goals and tracking your, your progress towards it and capturing data and so on and so forth. So that's me.